Hello Autodidacts, thank you for joining me. In this video on organizational behavior, I will be going through the notes I took from this textbook. Um, this textbook is outdated. Um, I believe it's something like 20 or 30 years. It's ridiculously outdated. So this is more of a experimental dry run because I'm in the process of taking a course right now on iTunes use. So I'm just doing this video to fill the void here for the last couple of weeks because I've been working on a script and I'm having a lot of difficulty um, making it coherent and uh, I was hoping to get it up last week but that didn't work out. Then I was hoping this week and it's still not working out so I thought well I can just go through the notes on this outdated book so that like it's still good information it's just the new stuff has more added to it. But uh, I figured I could go through it because I also heard recently that it's better to have um, like point notes rather than a script when you're doing these videos. So I wanted to give that a try because doing the script work is is it's a lot of work, especially considering I don't have a computer. So I'm writing everything out by hand, and when I make a mistake or something needs to be changed, I have to go back and rewrite it all. So it's a ridiculous amount of time that's being consumed and I really wanted to find out if I can just go through my notes. Because if you look in my about description on my channel here, you'll see that I have a fair bit of uh, work on behavior that I would like to share with you. So um, this is just an experimental video. Um, you know, the lighting's not going right. I don't, not in full costume. My pets are able to come and go. I got static playing in the background. So eventually, when I finish this other course, this new course on organizational behavior, and I put together a new video, this, this one will get moved to Fota Originals. But yeah, so it's all just point notes. I don't think I'm gonna post any pictures or anything. I'm just gonna try, try to read through the notes in this form and uh, share with you what I have at the moment on organizational behavior. So this is Human Behavior at Work, um, Davis and Newstorm, Newstrom, Organizational Behavior. Now organizational behavior is basically group behavior in the workplace. Um, this is the seventh edition. Yeah, so there's that. And now I will start trying to get through this for you. So there's no simple formula for working with people. Some of the key elements are people, the structure, which is um, official relationships within the organization. Uh, some other key elements are technology and the environment. Organizations exist to serve people rather than people existing to serve organizations. The nature of people is broken down into individual differences, a whole person which is more than a skill or a brain, their motivated behavior, and the value of the person or the human dignity. Behavior relates to needs and wants and or the consequences that result from that action. Uh, to modify behavior, show the action will help fill f fulfill needs or action and ch or choice will decrease the chance of fulfilled needs. Yeah, I think I think script might be a bit better because these are jot notes for me. So there's blank spaces kind of thing. Um, people have psychological needs, social roles and status needs. Mutual interest. Um, without it, it makes no sense to cooperate. No common base on which to build. A contingency approach avoids acting on universal traits and seeks to study before acting. People generally want useful work which provides a sense of personal worth, challenging work that is internally satisfying, responsibility and opportunity to succeed. They want to be listened to and treated as if they have value and they want to feel as if their needs and problems are cared for 
and you know I can test to that I can't tell you how many how many jobs I I kind of quit where I just didn't feel valued elements of a favorable climate the quality of the leadership the amount of trust uh, the up and down communication uh, the feeling of useful work responsibility fair rewards reasonable job pressures opportunity reasonable controls structure and bureaucracy and employee involvement or participation um, I learned elsewhere that one of the best ways to get people to work for you to do stuff is to give them creative control so that kind, some of that kind of um, brings that to light okay so a fact premise is our view of how the world behaves behavior science and personal experience don't know what that means it's kind of an incomplete thought almost a value premise is our view of the desirability of certain goals are viable and under variable and under our control motivation is influenced by controls attitudes and situations oh here we have uh, I don't think this is organized properly fuck me I thought this came later on in the book okay well here we have a grid of the different types of uh, leadership in an organization and I, I expect one day I'll do a full out video on this this is pretty interesting stuff especially if you're starting a business or wanted to modify your business so we got four different kinds of leadership styles within an uh, organization we have autocratic custodial supportive and collegial so the basis of the model of autocratic is power the basis of custodial is economic resources the basis of supportive is leadership and the basis model of collegial is partnership um, autocratic managerial orientation is based around authority custodial is based around money um, supportive is based around support collegial is based around teamwork autocratic employee orientation demands obedience a custodial employee orientation uh, offers security and benefits supportive employee orientation uh, focuses on job performance and then collegial collegial employee orientation is focused around responsibility autocratic employee psychological result creates a dependence on the boss and the employee uh, custodial employee psychological result creates dependence on the organization supportive employee psychological result uh, it's participation and then uh, collegial employee psychological result creates more self-discipline um, autocratic employee needs are met and that creates substance custodial employee needs met creates security supportive employee needs met uh, gives them status and recognition collegial employee needs met is self-actualization actualization okay so these are the things that you get from under that leadership and then the performance result of autocratic leadership is the minimum uh, custodial performance result is passive cooperation supportive leadership's performance result is awakened drives and collegial performance result is moderate enthusiasm so the supportive um, leadership style is considered one of the most effective and you'll find it mostly in affluent nations like if you look at a autocratic which is something and we do get a lot here in uh, affluent nations but you can look at other countries and like um, communist countries and 
you'll quickly see that it's 1000% autocratic. There is no best approach, but each model is built on the accomplishments of another. So, yeah, I'll, I'll do a whole video on that because there's a lot to talk about in there. Uh, everybody seems to instinctively move towards autocratic because when you're in the position of power, um, you it, it's a high cortisol role. It's actually one of the highest. Like if you're you, if you got a group and then you have the banished individual, their cortisol levels are always high. You know they're isolated. Um, they're, they need. They need to help get their uh, needs and wants met, and that works best for humans when we work as a group. But when you come into power, um, you you have to make sure the group is coherent. You have to set the goals. You have to discipline everybody. You have the same amount of cortisol coming through, coming out of your brain there as uh, someone at the bottom. So when you're under that much stress. You, you tend to go for the easiest answer and the easiest answer is just tell people what to do be a dictator right but our studies have found that being supportive is actually the best way to get people you know into the job to do the job and increase their performance <clears throat> continuing on uh, both psychological and economic benefits are important to employee employees they tend they tend to compare rewards with others Social status is something people work hard on improving, maintaining, and protecting. Losing status can cause psychological distress. High statuses are high status um, is more power and influence. They receive more privileges. They participate more in group activities. They interact with more with peers in lower ranks and they have more opportunities to play more important roles lower status people feel more isolated and show more stress symptoms okay so that that's coming up again uh, um, typical sources of status on the job are your education your job level your abilities your job skill the type of work you do uh, the pay and method of pay you receive your seniority your age, and uh, the working conditions you're in. Status symbols are evidence of social rank. An example would be like furniture, interior decorations, locations of your workplace, facilities at the workplace, quality and newness of equipment you use, types of clothing normally worn, privileges given, job titles, and the employees assigned under you. Status is often the source of employee problems and conflicts. Motives are perceived as expressions of a person's needs, their internal ones. Incentives are external and provided by higher power statuses. Primary needs are basic physical needs. These are universal. Our secondary needs are social psychological needs. They're kind of vague. Nearly all motivating and influencing actions will address secondary needs. I think, okay, so that's that's an important note to there, say there is nearly all motivational influencing. So there, influencing and manipulation are very similar. Okay, so when you influence someone, what you're actually doing is you're aligning your goals and you get them to do what you want by helping them get what they want. Manipulation is kind of a forceful way of getting somebody to do what you want. So I'm pretty sure manipulation will usually focus on your basic physical needs, right? It'll be like, go do this for me and I'll make sure you get fed tonight or I'll keep you safe, right? Whereas an alignment might be like, well, you know, you think of yourself as responsible and this is an important task. I really need you to step up and do this, right? That that might be a bit more influencing, but even hearing that out loud makes me say, oh, that's manipulation. I'll probably do a video on that. You know, I'm just getting started. This is a long, a long game I'm playing here. So 
thank you for being with me if you're watching this video because by the time I expect to get anywhere in, in this channel, this video will be long buried beneath uh, better quality ones. Okay, so our secondary needs are strongly conditioned by experience. They vary in type, of in type and intensity among people. They are subject to change within any individual. They work in groups rather than alone, are often hidden from conscious recognition, are vague feelings instead of specific physical needs, and they influence behavior. We are only logical to the extent that our feelings allow us to be. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This is, this is, I don't have it in the notes here, but this is that pyramid you'll see in um, a lot of uh, um, psychology things. Maslow's hierarchy of needs at the bottom. You got your lower order ones, which are your physical, basic physical needs at the bottom. And then right above that is safety and right above that is safety and security. Those two are your lower order needs. And then um, your higher order needs are the next three, which is belonging and social needs esteem and status and with your highest one being self-actualization and fulfillment i i uh i've always had a bit of problem with this you know i have a history of uh drug addiction and at one point i was even homeless now i've gotten past all that obviously but um i've seen some pretty dark places in in the world and i know I've witnessed people don't give a shit about their basic physical needs if they don't believe in themselves that there's room in their life for self actualization or fulfillment you know they'll they'll just fuck off and go do some drugs and whatnot if if they don't believe that they're destined for that so I've always had a bit of a problem with it I think it should be more like a bunch of circles that kind of overlap with the self-actualization in the middle. I don't think, uh, I think that is necessary to be driven for all the other ones. You know, this is awkward. I'm looking at the screen, looking back at me, trying to get the feedback, but the camera's over there, but my face is over there. So I'm really sorry about this. The next video, I'll turn it around and look into the camera. But the last video, I had a problem with my mask always doing this, and it drove the hell out of me. So I, I want to, this is an experimental video, so I just wanted to be able to see my face here. Need satisfaction is a continuous issue. It cannot be permanently solved by satisfying a particular need today. People are more mov motivated by what they are seeking than what they already have. They may react protectively to try to keep what they already have but they move forward with enthusiasm only when they are seeking something else Herzberg's model okay I should probably try to show, zoom, show you this picture right here okay so it has a uh, high negative it has three sections right so um, it has high negative feelings, neutral feelings, and high positive feelings. Um, from the neutral over to high negative um, is maintenance factors. And then from neutral to high positive are motivational factors. M maintenance uh, factors are dissatisfiers, hygiene factors, job context, extrin extrinsic factors. Motivational factors are satisfiers, motivators, job content, intrinsic factors. Yeah, see, what, did, what the hell does that mean? Maybe, maybe you understand it better, but just, like, I really think I have to stick with writing scripts. <sighs> Who knows? Also. Maintenance examples. Company policy and administration. Quality of supervision. Relations with supervisors, peer relations, pay, job security, working condition, and status. Motivational examples are achievement, recognition, advancement, 
wor the work itself, poss the possibility of growth and responsibility. You know, my, my last job that I, I quit because the owner straight up told me that there's no room for growth here. You'll always be at the, the bottom of the hierarchy. And uh, that's, that, that's humiliating at a certain age. And if you can't go up, what are you really doing, right? Unless it's something you enjoy, but I sure as hell didn't. I probably shouldn't talk about that in videos like this. Employees are strongly motivated by what they do for themselves. When they take responsibility or gain recognition through their own behavior, they are strongly motivated. If these conclusions are correct, then management's role is to provide a supp supportive environment for employee performance. Management helps rather than bosses. That reminds me, because I am doing the other course, one of the things the other course mentions is organizational behavior is a course to help you become a manager. Behavior modification is based on the idea that behavior depends on its consequences. By manipulating consequences, one can modify behavior. I gotta stop there again. Okay, so cognitive behavior modification is the predecessor to cognitive behavioral therapy. That is one way you can tell this textbook is outdated is we no longer, we no longer do cognitive behavior modification. Um, stuff still seems kind of real and is just put under different names and whatnot, but uh, that's one of the outdated things that I'm fairly certain is no longer no longer relevant. Like, it may be real and you can still use it and stuff, but if you tried to put it on a test, you'd fail or get, get the question wrong. Unless it's a history test, psycho, a history test on psychology. Okay, so now we have some key terms and definitions. Uh, operant conditioning is any type of reinforcement to modify behavior by its consequences. The law of effect is the tendency to repeat behavior that leads to favorable consequences and to not repeat behavior that produces unfavorable consequences. Positive reinforcement is a favorable consequence that accompanies a behavior. Negative reinforcement, um, this is negative as in takes away from, is the removal of an unfavorable consequence that accompanies a behavior. Yeah, so you want somebody to do something, but there's like unfavorable consequence, so they don't do it, right? So let's say you're trying to teach, I don't know, soldiers to storm a room, and uh, one of the negative consequences is you get shot, well, you still need them to storm the room, but you want them, you, you want to be able to take, a, for negative reinforcement, you would somehow take away that shot, put on a bulletproof vest, you take away the, the negative consequence from it, you know, you don't die, you're more likely to storm that room. Okay, so moving on, still key terms and definitions, shapen is the successive reinforcement as behavior comes closer to the desired behavior. It is especially useful when teaching complex, complex tasks. Uh, punishment, this, this adds, okay? So unlike negative reinforcement, punishment adds to, to the whole sequence. It is an unfavorable consequence that accompanies a behavior. So, you, you know, like that saying, always slap twice on the first offense because turning the cheek, the other cheek leads to abuse. So that would be a form of punishment. Extinction is uh, no significant consequence accompanying the behavior. I'm, I always thought this one is weird. I bet you this is probably not u in use anymore. It's um, basically apathy, right? Someone does something, you don't really want them to do it you can tell they're doing it for attention, so you just don't give them the attention, right? I always thought it was kind of irresponsible on some level. And then your reinforcement schedule, that is the frequency 
with which reinforcement accompanies a desired behavior. Uh, you, a key thing in training anyone, whether it be people or animals, train, maybe even computers, you know, is uh, you got to be consistent. If you just do it for a bit and then stop, it was it, your your subject will consider it a phase or something. You know, they won't take the whole thing real very serious. You have to be consistent. Guidelines for applying behavior modification. Identify the exact behavior to be modified. Use positive reinforcements whenever possible. Use punishment only in unusual circumstances and for specific behaviors. Ignore minor undesirable behaviors to allow its extinction. Use shaping procedures to develop complex behavior. Minimize the time between the correct responses and reinforcement. Provide reinforcement frequently. Behavior modification works best when specific behaviors are identified. Okay, so um, that's some of those, like uh, the minimizing the time between correct responses and reinforcement, that's vital when you're training animals. You know, they don't have the same mental cap memory capacity as humans, so you, you have to get that reinforcement within the first two to three minutes. And I wanted to back up and look at the shape and behavior. Uh, successive reinforcements as behavior comes closer to the desired one. Okay, so let's say you're teaching somebody anything that's really difficult. So they're, let's say they're coming up learning lock picking, right? And uh, there's some specific ways to pick a lock, and then there's other ways that the uninitiated will just just uh, jump right into. So if you're trying to teach somebody how to pick a lock, you would probably reward them whenever they get it right. You'd reward them whenever they open the lock, and uh, you'd try to, you know, teach them the position and, and postures and stuff of how you hold stuff, and you want to reward them for that. Now you don't have to pay them or anything or physically pat them on the back but just you know a little something like oh good you're improving people people like to be recognized so and validated so, and more often than not that's the most effective reward you can give is just validation so now we move on to motivational patterns um, achievement it, a drive to overcome challenges advance and grow affiliation a drive to relate to people effectively. Competence, a drive to do high quality work. Power, a drive to influence people and situations. The expectancy model. Valen, val, valence times expectancy times instrumentality equals motivation. Uh, so, valence is how much one wants the reward. Expectancy, one's estimated probability that effort will result in successful performance. Instrumentality, one's estimate that a performance will result in a reward. You will motivate by, one, the effect of perception of the, re of the reward and two, strengthen the reward value and connection between effort, performance, and reward. Situations lead into different attributions. Yeah, this is one of those things where a script would work really well because I'm just freeballing it here and uh, trying to read that out coherently situations it, it's great it's a little difficult there so situations lead into different attributions on the top we have personal personal situational and then um oh personal then situational and then going down we have stable and uh, unstable so stable personal is ability stable situational is task difficulty unstable personal is effort Unstable situational is luck. 
so I have no idea what's going on there. It's a good thing this isn't the the real one. I want to provide value, not confusion. Some elements of life satisfaction are job, politics, religion, leisure, and family. Employee theft is done by almost half of employees. Um, tight controls and harsher punishments do not always work since they are directed at symptoms rather than the underlying causes such as severe dissatisfaction. And I know I'm going to be doing uh, a video at some point in the future on um, workplace fraud, saboteurs in the workplace, employee theft will come up and I know I can dive right into that. Um, generally the best way to prevent it, it, it starts at the top, you know, if your boss gives off the impression that they're stealing from the customer, they're stealing from the supplier, they steal from themselves, I've seen that in a workplace, um, everyone below them will be just like, it's okay, just don't get caught, right? Uh, older people are slightly more satisfied than younger people on, with their job. Uh, the older people have more experience, whereas the younger people have higher expectations. Uh, occupational level, higher levels tend to be more satisfied. Organizational size, satisfaction declines as it gets larger. Communication is further and employees feel loss of control of factors that affect them. Yeah, so you might be more happy working at a little mom and pa shop than maybe a big chain like Walmart. And if you look at the stuff they're saying about Amazon, I don't like. I think people kind of get stuck into that. They having to take that. They don't enjoy it. Like, who wants, who wants a job where your entire break is running to the lunchroom and then back? You don't get time to eat, go to the bathroom. I tend to punch up a lot, so I could, like, if somebody's trying to, say, get back to work and I have to go to the bathroom, I, I could see myself getting into some trouble. But that's why I am where I am, at the bottom of the barrel. Human responsiveness is key to higher job satisfaction. A leader's dissatisfaction will spread to their team. Uh, Strive to gain insight to job satisfaction. Higher turnover is an indicator of low job satisfaction. Communication improves satisfaction. Money has status value. Be wary of giving the minimum. Okay, so that's another little tricky one, you know. If you do something for free, your brain is going to force you to enjoy it. it. It has to rationalize it somehow. And generally, it'll be like, well, I'm doing it for free. I like it, right? So on the one hand, getting people to do free stuff for you is more effective than paying them more. Because the higher, the more you pay somebody, the more difficult they perceive the task. But... You know, you you also should never try to focus on giving the minimum. If people, like, people judge how much they make in relation to others. So if you're giving, them, giving somebody the minimum, they're going to see themselves as low rank and that's going to um, lower their satisfaction and increase your turnover. So you want to find some place in between. You want, you don't want to give them too much because then they'll, they'll find themselves dissatisfied a lot easier. They'll say the job's a lot more difficult than it actually is. But you don't want to give them the lower amount because then they get humiliated. So you either want them to do it for free, right? For, um, uh, uh, what's it called? Reputational value. Or you want to get them somewhere in between the lowest and the highest. And you'll, you, you'll probably notice in your own life that any job where people are offered the, the minimum pay 
will have a high turnover rate you know most employee employers know that you, you don't expect to keep your employees in the, over the course of five years and when you do get somebody who stays for five years it's either they're trapped or they're satisfied you know you, you pay them decently uh, you talk to them you value their their human side okay so now we got a little balance scale here um, yeah. so, and it's outputs compared with others versus inputs compared with others on the output side we have actual pay and benefits social rewards and psychological rewards and then on the input side is job effort education seniority performance and uh, job difficulty and other inputs see like this would have been nice to have scripted out because what is this talking about okay so you're the employee for the output is what you get and you compare that with others like I was talking earlier actual pay and benefits social and psychological rewards and the input would be what you put into the position so your effort your your skill level like your education and so on doesn't seem like it's coming out too too bad like this probably saves me a week or two worth of work if I can just turn all my notes into dialogue I don't know I'll, I'll have to review this video and s learn from it so the personal cost and reward are compared the point where they are approximately equal is where motivation begins a little bit below equal and, and uh, the reward is both intrinsic and extrinsic extrinsic oh I always get nervous in these videos I prefer to be behind be behind the camera and I've noticed that like most of my videos I get burpy and get get the burps so I apologize there pay incentives need to be simple enough to have a strong belief that performance and effort will bin, bring the reward leadership is still an art despite the efforts of social sciences and researchers to make it a science this is said by James Owens leadership is the process of encouraging and helping others to work enthusiastically towards objectives it is the human factor that binds a group together and motivates it towards the goals leadership depends on appropriate behaviors skills and actions not personal traits there are three types of skills there are technical skills human skills and conceptual skills a technical skill is a person's knowledge and ability in any type of process or technique it deals with things human skills are the ability to work effectively with people and build teamwork it deals with people conceptual skills is the ability to think in terms of models frameworks and broad relationships such as long-range plans and it deals with ideas the three elements of a leader three elements to goal completion are the leader the followers and the situation To be an effective leader, one must also be a good follower. This keeps them well balanced. Effective follow, follow, followership skills are avoid competing with the leader, be, lo be a loyal devil's advocate, constructively confront the leader's ideas, values, and behavior. Leaders create a work environment through structure, support, and rewards that help employees reach organize the organization's goals. And we got a little bit of a flow chart. A leader identifies the employee's need. This leads to the appropriate goals are established. This leads to the leader connects rewards with the goals, which leads to the leader provides assistance on the employee's path towards the goal. This leads to the employees becoming satisfied and motivated as they accept the leader, which leads to effective performance, 
which leads to both employees and organizations able to reach their goals. Goal setting. <clears throat> Define the goals. Explain the purpose and necessity. It needs to be meaningful. Set specific goals. So one knows when fin they're finished. Do not say do your best. It's too vague. Make them challenging. People work harder when it's not easy. Give them feedback about com accomplishments. This encourages performance. Now, it's important to note that that says feedback, not criticism, right? You want to, uh, if it's a situation where you need to criticize someone, you want to frame it in the most positive light. Also, you should never um, give people negative feedback or criticism in public unless you're trying to make an enemy. Um, so if you've got an underperforming uh, employee, you want to take them aside and, um, and give them that feedback. But if you do need to punish them, and sometimes you do, because if you don't punish uh, underperformers, the whole group suffers. Your best performers get really upset with that. You, you have to punish underperformers. And one way you can do that is in the public uh, public criticism, right? Saying you suck at that in front of everybody. That that's that's a type of a punishment. Normally, you should take them aside and be like, "Hey, you could improve in this area." Leaders provide both task and psychological support. Leaders are role models. Their behavior spreads to the group. Power in politics is dealt with by leaders. Power is influence on people and events. It is earned or gained by personality, activity, and situations. Authority is different than power because influence is given by a higher authority. When it comes to authority, an excellent book on power would be The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. Uh, he's my favorite author, and he is probably the the only book I've had real exposure to that really breaks it down this organizational behavior does get into power but not nearly as in depth as Robert Greene's work the collective work of Robert Greene's I feel is an essential reading for anyone who uh, anyone I guess everyone should read it in my opinion all his, his collective work all of everything he's done. Um, that's the 50th law, 48 laws of power, the laws of seduction, laws of human nature, 33 strategies for war, mastery, and uh, I think his, he's working on one called the sublime. Politics is how leaders gain and use power. It is essential for personal success and for smoothing the path to employee performance. Major types of power. Uh, you got personal power, which is the ability to develop followers with strength of your own personality. People follow because they want to. Personal power is charisma, confidence, and conviction. Legitimate power comes from a higher authority. It gives leaders control over resources and it gives them the power to deploy rewards or punishments. It involves social pressure to accept it. Expert power comes from specialized learning. It arises from knowledge and information about a complex situation and it depends on education, training and experience. Political power comes from the support of a group. It arises from one's ability to work with people and social systems to gain their allegiance and support. And all these types of power are interrelated in practice. And we got another chart here. Tactics to gain political power. The tactic, social exchange an example. In a trade-off, the chief engineer helps the factory manager get a new machine approved if the manager will support an engineering project. 
the Tactic Alliance. An example, the Information System Manager and the Financial Vice President joined together to work for a new computer system. The Tactic Identification with a Higher Authority. An example, the President's Personal Assistant makes minor decisions for her. The Tactic Control of Information. An example, the R&D manager controls new product information needed by the marketing manager. Okay, so R&D is research and development. Uh, tactic, the tactic, selective service. An example, the purchasing manager selectively gives faster service to more cooperative associates. And uh, the tactic, power and status symbols. Um, it should be noted that these can backfire if you do not have the power equal to your symbols. Um, an example of power and status symbols are the new controller arranges to double the size of the office, decorate lavishly, and employ a personal assistant. Uh, power plays, the, uh, the tactic power plays are risky as it may cause retaliation or and weaken your own power, but it's still a tactic to gain political power. So a power play example is manager A arranges with the vice president to transfer part of manager B's department to A. Uh, and the last tactic mentioned is networks. Um, an example is a young manager joins a racquetball team, a racquetball club. And networking is really important in the world. Um, you know, we're humans, we evolve together. Uh, we're able to pursue our desires because of dispersed responsibility for survival ones. You know, I don't have to go hunt my food. I don't have to go collect my water. I don't have to build my own house. I just gotta focus on my thing and other people's focus on their things. And collectively, we, um, we neutralize that baseline tension for survival and we can f focus on our desires so and the way you do that is with people and networks you know one thing rich people do is they don't really get rich alone they 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 have a group so let's pretend like you have a small town and you're a hat maker a rich person will the rich people in generally one person will have the that be the hat maker right but then they'll make an alliance with uh, maybe the material manufacturer maybe they'll make a, an alliance with the baseball team the local baseball team and they'll get the logo put on the hat and then maybe they'll get in with the government and pass a bylaw where you can't wear the other team's hat and now all of a sudden you've almost created a monopoly on you you're you're the local hat maker but you have all these things working to keep you stabilized and yeah so network you know it's important okay management by objectives <clears throat> objectives to reach goals are uh, agreed upon by supervisor and employees it gives employees freedom creative freedom to meet objectives rather than constant supervision it is re their work is reviewed in intervals to avoid deviation leadership style is represented by a leader's f philosophy skills and attitudes in practice okay i, I gotta take a quick break here Sorry about that. I, I do think it'll probably be a good idea to keep doing breaks as I go forward, because if I'm ever successful, I'll need to make space for co those commercial ads. I hate it when they pop up when you're in the middle of a thought, so I'm, I'll have to figure out how to do this better. I mean, I'm already 20 seconds back and I'm still talking about the break. Um, okay, so McGregor's Theory X and Theory Y are alternative assumptions about employees. And I think um, I'll just read through theory X first and then go to theory Y instead of back and forth. Uh, theory X, 
The typical person dislikes work and will avoid it if possible. The typical person lacks responsibility, has little ambition, and seeks security above all. Most people most people must be coerced, controlled, and threatened with punishment to get them to work. With these assumptions, the managerial role is to coerce and control employees. I personally don't agree with that. I think people do like work and are responsible. I think um, they are ambitious. They just, you, you have to give them the situation where they can sort of nurture, nurture that kind of stuff. If you're always forcing it on them, then that's, that's gonna be what you get. So theory why is work is as natural as play or rest. Already it sounds like this is the one I prescribe to. Um, theory, continuing with theory why, people are not inherently lazy. They have become that way as a result of experience. People will exercise self-direction and self-control in the service of objectives to which they are committed. <clears throat> people have potential. Under proper conditions, they learn to accept and seek responsibility. They have imagination, ingenuity, and creativity that can be applied to work. With these assumptions, the managerial role is to develop the potential in employees and help them release that potential toward common objectives. Yeah, I definitely prescribed a theory why. You know, this channel's a testament to the proof of it. I mean, I'm a schizophrenic. I live by the grace of government handouts. I, I, I don't have to do anything, right, with my life kind of thing I, I can do whatever I want and here I am I have a goal you know I would like to open my own bit, private investigation and consultation business I'd like to write books all this just comes from the result because I'm in a situation where I can e explore myself you know and uh, I work I work harder and longer than a lot of people I know with jobs they go to work for eight hours a day I'm I'm working pretty much all day every day on this huge goal that's still 15, 15, 10, 15 years away from seeing any sort of fruit. So I definitely prescribed a theory why. <clears throat> Pos positive leaders motivate with rewards. Negative leaders place emphasis on pen penalties. Positive leadership generally achieves higher job satisfaction and performance. I just had a thought about our society like one of my main areas of study is the criminal behavior, I guess you could say, like uh, crime and whatnot. And uh, our entire justice system places a huge emphasis on penalties. Uh, we don't really motivate people with rewards kind of thing. Like I guess, if, you know, there is some of that going on, but we don't say hey thank you you're a good person for not stealing or killing that person right we we focus on saying if you kill somebody you'll go to jail and get banished from your your community i wonder if there is a way of lowering crime rates by uh you know rewarding people for good behavior you don't really get rewarded for doing the right thing you're expected to do it Autocratic leaders centralize power and decision. Blah, 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 blah. Autocratic leaders centralize power and decision making in themselves. Participative leaders decentralize authority, consult with followers, and participation by them. Free reign leaders avoid power and responsibility, depend on group to establish their own goals and work out its own problems. Okay, so right there we got three different types of leaders. And I'm gonna deviate again. I kind of like this this format over the script because I can talk about other things. So an autocratic leader, it's a misconception in our society that this is what an alpha is like. They, they kind of rule with an iron fist. An alpha's main job is protection of the group and quelling disorder. An alpha tends to be more of a participative leader you know, they, if there's 
if there's a problem among members, uh, their job is to determine whether or not they need to step in. And uh, a lot of the time they don't, they're not supposed to step in. They gotta let people sort it out themselves. But everybody thinks that the autocratic leader is the alpha, someone who comes in, controls a situation, and tells them what to do. A person like that isn't an alpha. They're, they're seriously running the risk of becoming an omega, a banished individual. You don't tell people what to do. You work with people based on what I've learned in my life, you know. <clears throat> okay, so moving on. Consideration style. This is also known as employee orientation. There is consistent evidence that leaders secure higher performance and job satisfaction when a leader is concerned with the human needs of their employees. They build teamwork and help with personal problems. Task orientation style. This is also known as structured leadership. It is believed that they get results by keeping people constantly busy and urging them to produce. Participation. I think this is participation or style. It is mental and emotional involvement of persons in group situations that encourage them to contribute to group goals and share responsibility for them. It can increase power and influence in spite of our instinct to believe otherwise. Pre prerequisites for participation is one, adequate time to participate. Two, potential benefits greater than the costs. Three, relevance to the employee's interests. Four, adequate employee abilities to deal with the subject. Five, mutual ability to communicate. Six, no feeling of threat to either party. Seven, within the area of job freedom. Conflict arises from disagreement over the goals to attain or the methods used to accomplish them. Variety of issues lead to conflict. Organizational change, personality clashes, different sets of values, threats to status, contrast in perceptions and points of view. Some advantages exist in spite of obvious disadvantages. Stimulate these advantages, stimulates the search for improved approaches and reveal hidden problems. Yeah, see, these are my own notes I sh and I'm pretty well versed in behavior. I shouldn't be confusing myself so much. So if you're new to this, I'm betting a lot of this is more confusing than it needs to be. So hopefully I'll be able to fix that for the actual crash course I do on organizational behavior. When I, when I get, a, get to that, I'm currently working on a different script and then I got some more brainwashing scripts. So little by little, Maybe tune back in a couple years and I'll have something significantly better quality by then. This year it's all about practice and consistency. Okay, so we got a little graph here. Uh, different outcomes is the title. And then on the top we have I want you. And then on the side we want I want you. And it's a lose, win, lose, win, thin. So you get lose-lose, win-lose, lose-win, win-win. That reminds me of game three. I'm actually, I work on multiple things at a time and one of the scripts I am working on is game theory. <laughs> Assertive training, dealing with the anxiety and produce Dealing, la, 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 assertive training in brackets, dealing with anxiety producing situations. Learn to express feelings, ask for favors, give and receive compliments, request behavior changes, and refuse unreasonable requests. Assertive people are direct, honest, and expressive. They feel confident, gain self-respect, and make others feel valued. 
By contrast, aggressive people may humiliate others and unassertive, unassertive people elicit either pity or scorn from others. Both alternatives are typically less effective for achieving a desired goal. I think overall my channel's goal will be to make you an assertive person. I like I know that I myself I think I'm definitely more assertive, you know, I don't like humiliating others. And uh, I really don't like playing the victim. There's so many reasons in my life that I am. I prefer to try to kind of cover that up. Stages of assertive behavior. Number one, describe the behavior. Number two, express your feelings. Number three, empathize. Number four, negotiate a change. Number five, indicate the consequences. Assertiveness improves with nonverbal language. Eye contact, erect posture, and direct position engagement. Strong, modulated voice tone and volume. That's something I really got to work on is my voice. I know in some of my other videos on the brainwashing one, I really liked it. And some of my earlier videos, I was wearing my chainmail armor, and it wouldn't allow me to open my lungs all the way. So it made me one sound more nervous, two run out of breath, and made my voice kind of more high pitched. I know I definitely want to work on my voice, but I'm also still a smoker, and I keep telling myself I'm not working on my voice until I quit smoking. Okay, so now we move on to describe different ego states. The parent ego state. This is protective, controlling, nurturing, critical, or instructive. The adult ego state is rational, calculating, factual, and unemotional. The child ego state is spontaneous, dependent, creative, or rebellious. Stroking is any act of recognition for another. It can be positive, negative, or mixed. It can be physical, verbal, or eye contact. The best meeting size is between five and seven people. Capable leadership reinforces a climate of psychological support for change. Employees need to participate in change before it occurs, including, including them in the planning process. Rewards build employee support for change, both economic and psychological. Management guidelines for responsible change are, number one, avoid unnecessary change. Make it only if it is needed or useful. Number two, Change by evolution, not revolution. Gradually, not dramatically. Number three, recognize the possible effects of change and introduce it with adequate attention to the human needs. Number four, share the benefits of change with employees. Number five, diagnose the problems remaining after a change occurs and treat them. So when they're talking about a change, they're talking about a workplace change, right? Like you know, maybe a procedure, procedure or a new product or something, or a change of product. Organizational development emphasizes the whole orga organization as an operating system to bring about change. Steps include diagnosis, data collection, feedback and confrontation, action planning, team building, intergroup development, and a follow-up. Okay, so now we got this little pyramid on the division of labor. Um, so at the top, you got the leader, and then that gets broken in, in this little thing. Obviously, the numbers don't have to be the same. So the top is one leader, below is three betas, and below that is nine neutrals. Um, Yeah. 
yeah, I didn't include the example in my notes, and I can't remember the example properly. I know it invo involved uh, tools and equipment and sharpening them or something. Sorry about that. Do not overlook the fact that it is the subordinate who controls the response to authority. Specialization is important but can lead to conflicts. So specialization is like you have 50 employees, uh, 49 of them are farmers and one of them is a hoe sharpener. The hoe sharpener is specialized as is, I guess as is the 49 farmers, right? Too much supervision is less productive. Receivers of work it, feel psychologically inferior, leading to lower status and avoid using lower status individuals as initiators. Okay, so when somebody tells you what to do, you feel inferior to them. And this is saying, don't let the lower status person tell other people what to do. Informal organizational behavior arises from people who associate with one another. Informal and formal leaders need to work together to create workplace harmony. Informal relationships encourage formal cooperation. Only employees who are totally disinterested in their work do not engage in the grapevine. So that's the informal group, informal hierarchy, I guess. You know, you'll have the gossiper, I guess, and they kind of bring everybody together on some level. 75% of grapevine information is accurate. So people talking about it, each other, you can usually trust it. But sometimes it's bullshit. One out of four times it's bullshit. Three out of four times it's accurate. Given the proper situation and motivation, any of us tends to become active on the grapevine. Excitement and insecurity equal a rise in grapevine activity. Both men and women are equally active. Uh, the grape five can grapevine can cut and penetrate security screens. That means a lower status person can get, you know, some information from a higher one if they have that informal relationship. Rumors are unverified stories repeated to many. They need rumors need to be an interest in subject and have a sense of ambiguity. Rumors should be dealt with firmly and consistently. A guide for rumor control is to remove the cause of the rumor to prevent it. Apply efforts primarily to serious rumors. Refute rumors with facts. Deal with it as soon as possible. Emphasize face-to-face -face supply of facts. Provide facts from reliable resources. Refrain from repeat, repeating the rumor when refuting it. So don't say it out loud when you're trying to get rid of it, right? Encourage assistance of informal network leaders. So seek out those popular people. Get them to help you get rid of the rumor. Listen to the whole rumor to understand what it means. Yeah, so like are they really clowning on somebody because they don't like them or does the person is the person actually like a clown a dehumanizing environment job or sy system equals a high job dissatisfaction participation occurs with high job satisfaction job enrichment matters um so the, the high job satisfaction will come from a challenging task, a variety of tasks, the encouragement of an achievement, the opportunity for growth, and, when res and responsibility, advancement, and recognition must be provided. 
dimensions of jobs, the task variety, task identity, the big picture, task significance, how important it is, the autonomy and the feedback, meaning times responsibility times knowledge of results, the feedback, equals motivated and potential score. Older workers are more resistant to change, even if the change improves quality of work life standards. And you know, they don't mention it, but that probably comes in with uh, various cognitive biases. You know, the more you do something, the harder it is for you to get away from it. That's why when w women, usually women, end up in violent relationships, the longer they're in it, the less likely they are to leave. And that's, that's a type of um, cognitive bias. I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head, but that's something you should keep in mind for yourself is the more you do something, the harder it is to get out. So like if you're investing, the longer you're invested, the less likely you are to sell when it starts to fall. And if you're aware of this in your, and you see it in yourself, you're, you're better equipped to protect yourself. So that's, that's just a little side note there. Individuals in conformity, like an organization, are stripped of their self-esteem in an artificial environment. There's no challenge, no chance for psychological fulfillment, and offers, it offers security to people who say yes. Individuals use organizations to reach their goals. Organizations use individuals to achieve their objectives. Three major groups to which one conforms are the organization, their job, the informal work group, their family and community, their friends, and the external community. So, you know, their, their, their tribe, I guess you could say. Four conditions to, per to perceptions of privacy invasion. Personality information used. No permission obtained unfavorable consequence and the disclosure was external meaning somebody else talked about it there preventive discipline <clears throat> um, preventive discipline standards known and understood followers are most likely to follow the rules they helped create and the system relationship corrective discipline Action that follows infraction of a rule. Discar Discharge in business is ultimate corrective disciplinary action, so getting fired. Discipline should be administered impersonally. Okay, I think that contradicts something I said earlier, because I said make it a little personal, take them aside and whatnot, and this is saying, well, maybe that's a bit of a... Uh, like it's I don't know I think you should always try to be warm even if you're in the process of disciplining in someone criticizing them being an asshole because you feel it coming out of you you should always try to be warm and try to treat your 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 subject your victim your target whatever as a human being recognize them validate them it things go smoother <clears throat> when you put up barriers, people like to smash stuff, right? So that might be an outdated thing. Maybe I'm the one who's completely in the wrong. Counseling as a discipline. Counsel as opposed to progressive penalties. Emphasize on do this rather than don't do that. Bargaining tactics. The counter proposal. Two sides get closer. Trade offs. One gives up to win later. One gives something up to win later. A recess is to take a break for private discussion. A delay of items is the attempt to wait for change of events. Mediation. At stalemates, a third party authority comes in. Like and this can be an example would be like a strike and then having someone come in and mediate things. Discrimination is an action. 
Prejudice is a state of mind. Communication is two-way. The sender sends and the receiver understands. Once people know what you're trying to do, they generally will respond favorably if you communicate the facts that lead to the need for action. The communication process, one, develop an idea, two, encode it, three, transmit it, four, receive it, five, decode it, and six, use it. Communication barriers, personal, arise from emotions, values, and poor listening. Physical, arise from the environment. Semantics, limitations in symbols and language. Nonverbal, posture, attentiveness, use of space, and the control of time convey messages through action. A failure to act is a communication. Actions speak louder than words. Body language, hands and face are important sources. Ecological controls, nonverbal communication. The impersonal environment is altered to influence another's behavior. Okay, so that that comes up a lot in um, the intelligence um, world where they teach influence. That might be something like uh, wearing a lab coat. Everybody, a lot of people know that example where if you put on like a doctor's lab coat or something, people consider you more credible. So that that's a, a type of ecological control. A uh, quick little guide to readable writing. <clears throat> Use simple words and phrases. Use short, familiar words. Use personal pronouns like you or them. Use illustrations, examples, and charts. Use short sentences and paragraphs. Use active verbs rather than past tense verbs. And use only necessary words. Hearing is with the ears, but listening is with the mind. Good listening is a form of behavior modeling. It encourages listening in, in others. Good listeners use idle time, thinking of the speaker's objective, weighing evidence, searching for examples and clues to meaning and to review what is being said. Listen, listening is a conscious act requiring willpower. It is not a simple passive exposure to sound. Effective listening to be an effective listening listener stop talking number one stop talking number two put the talker at ease with the permissive environment number three look and act interested interested listen to understand rather than to oppose that's actually i think kind of important it is super annoying talking to somebody who only talks to like oppose what you're said you can't advance the conversation conversation if they're always putting up that kind of wall number four remove distractions number five empathize empath empathize with the talker number six be patient don't interrupt or leave number seven hold your temper number eight Go easy on argument and criticism. Number nine, ask questions. And number 10, stop talking. Ideas should be emphasized more than words. We remember communications that are personal, timely, and brief. They require our participation in completing them and are applicable to future situations. Conditions that encourage acceptance of a communication. <clears throat> acceptance of legitimacy of the sender. Perceived sender competence. Trust in the sender. Perceived credibility of the message. Acceptance of tasks and goals in the message. And the power of the sender to enforce sanctions on the receiver. Stress is a condition of strain on one's emotions. 
thought processes, and physical condition. When excessive, it can threaten one's ability to cope with the environment. Typical symptoms of stress. <clears throat> Nervousness and tension. Chronic worry. Irribil inability to relax. Excessive use of drugs, of drugs and alcohol or other self-destruction things like gambling, shopping, or eating. Insomnia. Uncooperative attitude. Feelings of inability to cope. Emotional instability. Digestive problems. High blood pressure. So like me getting all burpy is a sign of... Uh, sign of stress and that's that's because I'm more of a behind the camera guy in front of the than an in front of the camera guy um, the physical effects in the short term are headache and upset stomach the long term stomach ulcers dege degenerative heart disease kidney and blood vessel degenerative disease okay so there's there's a I think I can add to that a bit um, so Cortisol is considered the stress hormone, and um, that's because it's it's often released in stressful situations. But uh, it's a part of the fight or flight response, and it's released alongside with uh, adrenaline, right? Which uh, gives you the power to fight or flee. And cortisol is a blood coagulant, so if you get wounded in a life or death situation, cortisol helps keep the blood in your body. And uh, it's been found that being stressed all the time and always having cortisol pumped through your veins is leads to calcification of the arteries. It's probably what uh, this talks about here, the degenerative heart disease. It probably contributes to that. I can't say for sure, but from what I've read elsewhere, it leads to calcification of the arteries and is worse on your heart than smoking. So... It's, that's an important note is you should try to live a stress-free free life in some respects that's what would make smoking a good thing for you if you're a stressed out person you can take that addiction right you you put the addiction into you so that you're constantly um, oh, constantly relieving the stress from the withdrawal and um, Smoking may be bad for you, but as long as you're able to keep yourself satisfied with your addiction, you're lowering your cortisol levels, which it's kind of the lesser of two evils at that point, right? A burnout is when one suffers from chronic fatigue, boredom, boredom depression, and alienation. The symptoms are emotional exhaustion, detachment from relationships, and low sense of personal accomplishment. Positive stress stimulates people. Negative stress distracts. Too much or too little stress is bad. <clears throat> so we should be stressed out a bit. Life's not easy. It's not. I don't know what it's supposed to be, but <clears throat> it's not easy for anyone or anything. Even like the super rich and powerful people still got to deal with assholes, mortality, health, you know. So some examples <clears throat> of stressors. An autocratic supervisor. Insecure political climate. Inadequate authority to match the responsibilities. Work overload. Time pressures. Poor quality supervision role conflict or ambiguity differences in local and personal values a change of any type frustration it is frustration is being blocked from reaching a goal its reactions are aggression apathy withdrawal regression fixation physical disorders and substitute goals Type A people are aggressive, competitive, set high standards, and work well under time constraint pressures. Type B people are relaxed and easygoing, accept rather than fight situations, and have less stress problems. I've always wondered about this because I kind of, I think I, I fit into both.
to reduce stress actions, meditation, 15 to 20 minutes a day, biological feedback, which is instrument feedback to reduce heart rate, so like breath-based exercise, I guess, personal wellness, lifestyle, and healthy. Hmm. People with good mental health, number one, feel comfortable about themselves. They are not overpowered by emotion. They have tolerant attitudes. They accept their own shortcomings. They can deal with most situations. They take disappointments in stride. Neither overestimate or underestimate their abilities. They have self-respect and they enjoy simple, simple pleasures. Number two, people with good mental health feel right about other people. <clears throat> They're able to love and give consideration to the interests of others. They have lasting and satisfying personal relationships. They expect to like and trust others. They respect differences. They do not push or get pushed. They feel a group connection. They have a sense of responsibility to their community. People with good mental health number three are able to meet the demands of life. They act on problems that arise. They shape or adjust their environment. They welcome new ideas. They set realistic goals. They put the best effort in and get satisfaction of what they do. They accept responsibilities. They plan ahead and do not fear the future. They use natural abilities and they are able to think and make decisions. I suspect this that's something that'll probably not be in this course. Like I said, I'm doing an updated version and this is an outdated textbook here, so I can imagine that they they kind of ditched that. Maybe not, you know. One thing I've already noticed as a difference is the other one brings up learning. Learning is important and this this textbook does not mention it. I'm looking forward to finishing it. Counseling aims to help and grow self-confidence, understanding, self-control, and the ability to work effectively. The functions of counseling are advice, reassurance, communication, release of emotional tension, clarified thinking, and reorientation. Reorientation, that might be reframing you know, to frame an idea, reframe the idea. Directive counseling, <clears throat> listening to one's problem, helping decide what should be done, then telling them to do it. Non-directive counseling is listening and encouraging explanations. Professional counseling is attempt to find hidden iceberg issues. So an iceberg issue is like somebody's angry all the time, and but that's on the surface and what might be hidden hidden below is they just might be super depressed and don't know how to express that or what to do about it um okay so i think that ends up the counseling part and i do i did study cognitive behavioral therapy and its predecessor predecessor behavior modification which i touched on a bit earlier one thing i'll note is Therapists or counselors, I guess, counselors and therapists generally don't have the answer. You do. Their job is to help you flush it out and help you be your own therapist. So <clears throat> an effective therapist or counselor, they'll be an end date. They'll, they'll teach you what you need to know. They'll help you flourish it out and you will be expected to take on that role a terrible therapist or counselor has no end date. It's always come back next week, come back next week. And what they'll usually do is they'll just listen, which is a good thing, but they'll tell you to vent and they're not providing you any real insights. I imagine I'll probably do a video on that. I don't know when. I should probably make a note of it because that's kind of an important thing. I, I you know, I'm from, I, I'm schizophrenic, I've had a trouble upbringing and trouble, made poor decisions, so I'm very, very thoroughly exposed to counseling and uh, therapy, and I've met, like, I'm the guy people go to when the official system doesn't work, 
become like a, I guess you could say, kind of like a ghetto witch doctor, but a ghetto therapist, I guess you could say. And a lot of people, and I think especially rich people, get caught up with bad therapists and counselors and they go to it and don't have an end date and aren't taught how to how to manage right and that's one of my goals is i want to make i want to make um heroes out of everybody right you're the hero of your own life and a lot of people get caught in the victim or villain mindset and uh everybody suffers when people go down to that that road Continuing on. So, <clears throat> knowledge and skill equal ability. Attitude and situation equal motiva motivation. Ability and motivation equals human performance. Human performance and resources equal organizational performance. Ethical leadership is social responsibility, open communication, and cost-benefit analysis, economic, social, and human so reverse engineering that little little math in there for your business to perform you're going to need the people with the knowledge and the skills to do it but their attitude and motivation is also super important and as as like a leader or a business owner you know you have more control over than that than you do realize Hopefully uh, this 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 uh, video can help with a bit of that. Hopefully a future like completed proper crash course in organizational behavior will help with that. And I know as I go continue on to cover influence a lot more, that will help out a huge bunch. Task and social leadership roles. A task role is to define the problem or goal for the group is to request facts, ideas, or opinions from members. Provide facts, ideas, or opinions. Clarify a confused situation. Give examples, provide structure. Summarize the discussion. Determine whether an agreement has been reached. And those are almost communication, you know? Make sure everybody's on the same page. So, social leadership roles. They support the contributions of others and encourage by recognition. They sense the mood of the group and help members become aware of it. They reduce the tension and re reconcile disagreements. They modify your position and admit, oh, s leaders modify their position and admit an error. They facilitate participation of all members. They evaluate the group's effectiveness. Meetings are one of the best ways to secure commitment to the course of action. Commitment to the course of action. Feelings are non-logical. Logic alone is an ineffective means of trying to modify feelings because it does not get at them directly. The Hawthorne effect. The mere observation of a group tends to change it. When people are observed, they act differently. Psychological and social costs must be considered in cost-benefit analysis of a potential change. Psychological costs and change can lead to psychological distress and even affect physical health. Types of employees' resistance to change. Types of employee resistance is to change. Not types of employees, types of resistances by the employee. Logical and rational objections, the time, such as the time required to adjust, the extra effort to relearn, the possibility of less desirable conditions, such as skill downgrading, the economic costs of change, and the question technical feasibility of change. There are psychological and emotional attitudes that may resist change are fear of the unknown, low tolerance of change, a dislike of management or another change agent, a lack of trust in others, the need for security or the desire for the status quo. <clears throat> the sociological factors, um, the group interests that resist 
change our political coalition coalitions opposing group values uh pero chill pero kyle narrow outlook vested interests and the desire to retain existing friendships three steps to change number one unfreezing old idea <clears throat> old ideas or practices must be cast aside so that new ones can be learned number two changing new ideas or practices are learned three refreezing what has been learned is integrated into actual practice typically performance drops after a change and time is required to adjust a group is an instrument for bringing strong pressure on its members to change and that's the end of my notes i just want to quickly check the text to see if that covers it all I just kind of grabbed the notes and started the video. I didn't really prepare at all or anything here. So, all right. So part one is the fundamentals of organizational behavior. It covers one, working with people, two, climate and models of organizational behavior, three, social systems. Part two is motivation and reward systems. So main springs of motivation, motivating employees, job satisfaction, appraising and reward in performance. Part three is leadership and organizational change. So leadership and supervision, employee participation, interpersonal and group dynamics, managing change, organization development and training. Part four is the organizational environment. So structure, technology and people. Um, informal organizations, the quality of work life. Part five is the social environment, the individual in the organization, working with unions, equal opportunity, equal employment opportunity. Okay, so it doesn't sound like I covered these, but it, it does appear that I sort of did. I didn't really jump into different programs and stuff like that because I didn't really... I was more focused on writing notes about the psychology and not so much the stuff that might not so much exist. But yeah, so part six is communication and counseling, employee communication, communication relationships, employee stress counseling. Part seven is uh, the conclusion, organizational behavior and perspective. And then part eight is case problems and those are like key studies. So yeah, I think the notes are kind of complete there it doesn't cover some of the like little detailed stuff but anyway it doesn't really matter because this is just an experimental video and uh i'm doing its textbook is really outdated and like i said i am doing an updated course and the next behavioral video will be a complete crash course on organizational behavior with the updated stuff and then this one will get shifted to the, the photo or photo original playlist so this is this is more for practice than it is for I guess quality value kind of thing I do believe there's still value in it but I know they'll be better in the future I should say I guess so thank you for joining me and uh, remember all knowledge is power, and my goal is to leave you a little more powerful than you were when you found me. Photo out. Have a good day. Thank you.